An unusually dangerous year for avalanches in Colorado puts strain on the volunteers who make the rescues and the recoveries. The state promised them help years ago. We've been focused on the sustainability of our system. How do we make sure that we can continue to do what we're doing? Denver reopens an emergency shelter for more migrants coming here from the southern border. After lots of conversation about rising utility rates, it's time to talk solutions. Preparing for more abortion patients coming from one specific state. And the racist graffiti covering Wash Park has not been cleaned up. So a woman's just like, you know what, I'll do it myself. That's tonight on Next. The latest two Coloradans killed in avalanches over the weekend push us further past the number of deaths we typically see in a winter. And the danger in our backcountry is still high. The search and rescue teams that respond are nearly all volunteers. In addition to what they need to save lives, our Mark Salinger looks at a new focus to get those first responders what they need after the call. The year in Summit County started off slow. And then spring break hit and boom, we were getting a call or two every day. Search and rescue teams trek into Colorado's backcountry all the time. Now there's a push to make sure they have the support they need. We've been focused on the sustainability of our system. How do we make sure that we can continue to do what we're doing uh, from a funding perspective, from a resilience perspective? Anna DeBaptiste is with the Colorado Search and Rescue Association. Mental health has become a priority. There's a lot of a lot of uh, pressure put on the volunteers, uh, especially when someone's very badly hurt and their lives are in our hands to get them out in time. Legislation passed in 2021 mandated a study on backcountry search and rescue in Colorado. Now the teams have access for the first time to things like stress injury training and mental health resources. There's a fight for more. So we're making some small steps and we need to continue those. You know, our team is starting to recognize that this toll is different on every person. And Rain Jones is a volunteer with Grand that. County Search and Rescue. Of the nine avalanche deaths so far this winter, a third of them have been in Grand County. Recently, with the new legislation that was passed, there's more training available to us on this subject. And I think when this came out, teams were just like, yeah, we need this. The volunteers drop what they're doing every time someone needs help. Now the focus is on making sure the rescuers also get the resources they need. We are at nine avalanche fatalities across the state at this point in time, and, and the season's by no means over, so, so that's not a great number. So for context, in an average season in Colorado, we see six avalanche deaths. You heard her say that we're already at nine now. Volunteer teams respond to calls in their own cars and buy most of their own gear. Colorado Search and Rescue Association tells me they're fighting for more of their team members to get reimbursed for things like gas, responding to emergencies, as well as for help using some of the gear that they have to buy themselves. And of all the things that I might not have thought about, Mark, the issue of legal liability for these folks. Yeah, they tell me that just this past year they got liability from civil lawsuits. Think of some kind of similar trends to volunteer firefighters, for example. They said should have had that a long time ago, but they just now got it. Mark Salinger, thank you. The number of migrants coming to Denver has slowed down drastically since the beginning of the year when the city was running several emergency shelters to keep up with hundreds of new arrivals a week. Those city leaders are now saying they continue to struggle to meet the needs of about 1,200 migrants who remain in temporary shelters around the city. The Department of Human Services has just reopened an emergency shelter in a city building because other shelters were full. Shelters operated by nonprofits and volunteers are currently taking care of more than 1,100 of the migrants. Then the other 100 are in that newly reopened city shelter. The city is considering extending a local state of emergency through April that would open up various sources of funding. At this point, the city estimates it spent about $8 million on the effort since December. So we've talked here about why utility bills are high. Expensive natural gas, cold winter, let us to use more. Now let's talk about what we might do about it. Special legislative committee created to work on that problem heard suggested solutions today. Here's Marshall Zellinger. All right, stop what you're doing. If you think the idea of a utility company sharing the cost of high natural gas prices when it currently passes it on to you 100%, let's get the obvious out of the way. If you tell them there's only downside and you begin sharing a cost that you used to never have to worry about, prepare for a big fight 
and a lack of will to adopt. Albert Lin, who specializes in studying the finances behind utility policies, and former Public Utilities Commissioner Ron Lair, they testified in today's Rising Utility Rates Committee about ways to shift the responsibility of consumers paying 100 percent of natural gas costs. Right now, companies like Excel pass on natural gas costs dollar for dollar, and that amount changes on your bill every three months under ECA on your electric bill and natural gas on your gas bill. One suggestion today is that the company can only pass along so much each quarter, like 95 percent, with the ability to get paid back the rest when it has to prove its expenses during a big rate case, which happens about every two years. They're going to hold some of that risk until the time for the rate case and then there, it's going to be adjudicated. David Pomerantz from the Energy and Policy Institute or presented on getting political money out of utility bills. Above the line costs are paid for by ratepayers. Below the line costs are paid for by the utility shareholders out of money that would otherwise go to their profits. Pomerantz showed lawmakers where utility companies pass along costs to customers versus shareholders. For donations and membership dues to trade organizations, on the left, you can see millions passed on to customers on their bills. On the right, the numbers absorbed by shareholders in this category are actually higher. This slide shows the legal fees customers paid for the utility companies to argue for higher rates, which we've told you about several times. And this slide shows the amount customers paid for in advertising. Added up, it's a few dollars per customer Customer. To the companies, it totals millions. It might only be a dollar or two per customer, but for a company like Excel or Atmos or Black Hills, that is tens of millions of dollars per year that they can spend to argue for higher rates, for higher profits, to build more infrastructure of questionable need, and to block policies that could keep rates down. This committee, after now three hearings, will take a break because lawmakers need to deal with the budget. So the committee will be back in April, and that will be when potential legislation happens. If anything comes out of this legislature, it's going to have to happen by the beginning of May because then they're done for the rest of the year. Yeah. If nothing else, people now know they have legislators' ears. They can talk to their state legislators about this, and you've shown how easy it is for people to weigh in with the regulators themselves directly at the PUC. Mm -hmm. The Public Utilities Commission is currently hearing an, an Excel electric rate case that started in November. It'll, it, they want to raise rates in September. Yep. There's a minor hearing tomorrow okay. that was scheduled for 6.30 a.m. I'm not kidding. It's, it's a Zoom. It's a webcast at 6.30 a.m. A public meeting. A public meeting, which I checked. It, I mean, all they have to do is announce it at you know, 24 hours in advance or something, yeah. which they've done. It can be whatever time, I guess. And we've heard lawmakers, you know, they're into the middle of the night. But this is, it, it's, a, it's a hearing about something that the utility, our public defenders yeah. want data from Excel. The deadline's already passed and they're going to hear a hearing about why Excel couldn't meet this deadline. In the end, honestly, it's not going to matter. But it's at 6.30 in the morning. You've covered public meetings for what, about 20 years. Have you ever heard of a 6.30 a.m. public meeting? Not a brand new one. Again, the legislature, sure, but not, no. They've, they've continued through the night and they're still going at 6.30. Sure. Never at, hey, come by at 6 a.m., 6.30. We're going to start for the fresh. S something for the early risers. Well, you should get some sleep. Thank you, Marshall. Abortion providers in Colorado are preparing for an increase in out-of-state patients as more surrounding states try to restrict the use of abortion pills. Last Friday, Wyoming's Republican governor signed a bill that would ban the pills used in medication abortions. That's set to take effect in July. Wyoming also passed a separate measure banning abortions under most circumstances. Providers in Colorado say that they're expecting an immediate increase in patients coming down from Wyoming. When a state bans abortion, when one of our nearby states bans abortion, we immediately see an increase um, in, in patients who need help. Any person who lives in Wyoming who needs to access abortion care will have to leave the state in order to access that care. We've seen an enormous increase in out-of-state patients since the Dobbs decision this summer as states around us have started banning abortion, and I think that that will continue here. Jack Teeters with Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. He says their clinics in Colorado have seen a constant flood of out-of-state patients, mostly from Texas, ever since the Supreme Court overturned Roe. Teeters says more than 40% of their patients come from other states, 40% compared to 10% before the Dobbs decision. Democrats at the state capitol have introduced a few bills this session to protect abortion access, including one bill that would codify Colorado's existing decision not to participate in out-of-state investigations into patients or providers. A whole lot of kids in the Denver metro area are going to get new clothes for school thanks to your generosity. Your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign raised more than $30,000 for clothes for, to kids. It's a nonprofit that runs a, kind of like a boutique or a store, but nobody pays. Kids from low-income families can come in and pick out a whole wardrobe full of outfits. 
You've now raised more than $10.6 million for Colorado's nonprofit since 2020. So $5 donations add up. If you have an idea of a great nonprofit that could use our help, we'll take it. Email next at 9news.com. Denver taxpayers are also campaign donors this year, pouring about $7 million into matching donations through the Fair Elections Fund. We're watching the money as the last of it goes out. The majority of the mayoral candidates promise not to seek a third term. Let's look at why that's even an option. Racist graffiti is all over Wash Park. The city says the cleanup isn't simple. So one woman's just decided she could do it herself. Next. Denver's Fair Election Fund is still working out the kinks in its first year of operation. There were dozens of candidates who opted in for the 9 to 1 matching funds, which led to worries that the fund would run out of money. And some of the deadlines were changed during the middle of the campaign. The last matching funds were just distributed. So we can tell you that the city clerk's office reports paying out $7.1 million of the $8 million fund. So we did not run out of money. About half of the funds handed out, $3.5 million, went to mayoral candidates. Rest went to candidates for city council and other offices. Only one candidate in the mayor's race hit the $750,000 cap for fair elections funding. That was Kelly Bruff. No political newcomers, the folks who were designed to be most advantaged by this, cracked the top five in public financing. Instead, it was a lot of folks with existing political connections. Kelly Bruff, Mike Johnson, Leslie Harrod, Chris Hansen, and Debbie Ortega. Tonight's next question is about the power of Denver's mayor, who can serve three consecutive terms. Not even the governor can do that. Even the governor can only serve two. Most of the candidates in the race told us at our recent debate they would not seek a third term. Denver mayor may currently serve three terms. Please raise your hand if you would pledge to serve no more than two terms as mayor. Everyone here is making the pledge with the exception of Andy Rougeau. So why is the Denver mayor allowed three terms? What would it take to change that? So public officials in Colorado have had term limits since the 90s when voters passed constitutional amendments. They limited terms for statewide and national office and capped municipal offices like a, a mayor's race just two terms. The Supreme Court eventually ruled that states could not pass term limits that were more restrictive than the ones in the Constitution, but the Supreme Court allowed that the municipal term limits could stay in place as long as voters had the opportunity to change them. Denver's voters did that in 2000 passed a ballot amendment giving municipal officials like the mayor and city council the opportunity to serve up to three terms. So taking it back down to two terms would require a change to the city charter and then another vote by the citizens. Well, we're driving right now in Denver. We're seeing a lot of snow off to the west, and we're going to continue to monitor that over the next couple of days. Right now, a live look over downtown Denver. Lots of cloud cover here, but we're at 52 degrees. We have light winds coming in from the south-southeast at around 8 miles per hour. As you take a look at our HD Doppler radar, though, you can see all that activity off to the west. Scattered snow showers across the high country and into portions of the western slope. Even a couple of thunder showers making their way through portions of Grand Junction. Now, as we take a closer look into the front range, a couple of light Light rain showers pushing their way into portions of the front range, mostly across the Palmer Divide area. Denver, though, staying pretty dry. Now, because of all of this rain and snow, mostly snow, we're going to see off to the west into the high country and western slope. We have several winter weather alerts that will be in effect through portions of tomorrow and into Wednesday. We're going to expect several feet of snow further central and south in those high country areas. Now, other than that, we're going to see high winds. So we do have high wind watches that will be in effect Wednesday. This goes into effect throughout the afternoon. Wednesday in south central and southeastern portions of Colorado. In the meantime, we'll see decreasing clouds tonight, maybe with some very isolated light showers, overnight lows near 30 degrees. And tomorrow will be pretty warm. We'll see those temperatures near 60 degrees. We'll be in the 50s middle of the week as we watch for very spotty rain and snow chances, turning into more uh, scattered snow chances as we go into the weekend with those highs dropping into the 40s. She asked the city for months to clean up the racist graffiti in her park. That could be scary and terrible for children to see, let alone anybody else. Now she wants to take matters into her own hands. That's next. Denver's Wash Park is dotted with reminders that we live among racists and idiots, but I repeat myself. You go to the park and you'll see racists and profane graffiti on the bridges and poles and signs and you name it. One woman who's been asking the city for months to clean it up is about to go do it herself. 
I come here almost every day with my dog. This is Riley, and I just love this park. I always have. It's very family friendly, and it's beautiful. Hi, I'm Laura. Uh, I'm a concerned neighbor that lives near Washington Park, and wanted to share what I see that's going on that I don't think is right. About eight months ago, I started to see some really disturbing hate speech and profanity um, very prominently showing along the perimeter of the park. So I immediately called 311 and just said, hey, I, I know you'd want to know this. Finally, about three months ago, I got on 311 with this woman and she was so nice. And I said, I'll clean it. Like if no one has time, give me the paint and I'll do it myself. And so I um, arranged to meet with one of the Parks and Rec folks here, showed him what I, one of the places I saw and he said, that's all I need to see. We'll get it done. And that was three months ago. So I, I don't know what else to do. Well, with this being such a family friendly park, to not recognize how that could be scary and terrible for children to see, let alone anybody else, it's threatening and it's it makes me a little nervous. There's a sign down by the youth pond and on the sign there's profanity and I just think how could parents feel about that? It's so wrong, think about the children. that come to this park. And then if it's not a priority or if they just don't have time, allow the citizens, the neighbors, anyone to come and fix it. Like let us paint over it. I'm happy to. <laughs> Sometimes you got to shake the tree to get the fruit. Laura shook the tree and now the parks department tells us they're in touch with her to set up a volunteer cleanup. But they did note that they've recently covered up some of the graffiti and it just comes back. Your feedback is nice tonight. You feeling okay? I'll read it anyway, next. You have sent in a pant load of feedback tonight, uh, which aside, I regret teaching my five-year-old uh, that phrase because she uses it now, mostly in public. Uh, Amy writes, thank you for shining a light on the mountain rescue teams and the need for additional support. They are so important, she says, in our communities, keeping them healthy is essential. That was Mark Salinger's reporting tonight. Kathy drops in a nice note to say that word of thanks is the best thing to come out of the pandemic. Shows what a bit of good from a lot of people can accomplish. Apparently some feedback on the choice of jacket tonight. Jay Jones, nice suit, loving it. I guess it's been a while since I've worn this one. We're going to check uh, the pocket card. Uh, yes, January of uh, 2022 is the last time we wore this one. Uh, text though, somebody says Frank Nitty called wants his suit back. I had to look that up. I've never heard of Frank Nitty. Apparently he was Al Capone's right-hand man in Chicago. All right, that's fair enough. Lori says, I'm so tired of turning on the news to 10 minutes of shootings and other deaths. I appreciate next. Lori, that's what we talk about. We talk about the litany of tragedy that we're trying to avoid here. Years ago, we used to say there's one newscast in town, you turn it on, and the first segment was just everybody who died, and then they, they'd be like, coming up, who survived?